with the presentation. Again, just want to welcome everyone. I mean, if we haven't met before, my name is Shannon and I'm part of the Community Engagement and Events team at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. I want to thank all of you very much for joining us today for Family Law Now Live's presentation on establishing a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. I'm going to start with a bit of housekeeping uh, introductions and let you know what's on the agenda for today before handing things over to our panelists. And um, as we are presenting virtually today, we do apologize in advance for any technical issues that may come up. Once I do pass things over to our presenters, I'll be available behind the scenes for any questions or tech issues. So if you are having any challenges throughout the webinar, feel free to contact me at shannon at russellalexander.com and I'll do my best to help resolve the issue. So in this one hour presentation, Margie, Brittany and Nafisa will be discussing the following, defining diversity, equity and inclusion, the importance of equity, the importance of diversity and inclusion, challenges faced by indiv individuals based on gender, gender identity and race, diversity, equity inclusion, and inclusion in the workplace, what you can do to promote equity, diversity and inclusion in the workplace and in your personal life, the law society mandate, the LSO DEI questionnaire and inclusivity index, starting a committee, allies and leaders, and everyone has a role to play, funding the committee, the hidden cost of DEI work, supporting your DEI committee and others, mental health and well being, and the benefits of DEI in the workplace. And as I mentioned earlier, there will be a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So if you haven't already, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to those questions. And just a quick note, um, you'll notice that the chat has been disabled and this is just to allow everyone to remain anonymous to other attendees, um, but you can use that uh, Q&A function to send those questions in. And we also just ask that you please keep in mind um, that this content is to provide you with general information. And we will pro be providing additional resources in a follow-up email tomorrow. And just a quick note to everyone that is in the legal community, this program has been accredited by the Law Society of Ontario and contains one hour of EDI professionalism content. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our host today, Margie Primero Pemintel, Brittany Whalen, and Nafisa Nazarelli. Margie has been practicing family law since 2007. She is a collaborative collaborative family law practitioner and an accredited mediator who is passionate about facilitating fair and reasonable settlements for her clients. Margie approaches law in a holistic manner and believes that as a family lawyer, she has a unique opportunity to provide emotionally intelligent advice to clients that will assist them in moving forward with their lives in a, be a better position with the best interests of her clients and their children in mind. Brittany was called to the bar in Ontario in 2016 and to the Newfoundland and Labrador bar in 2017. As a family lawyer, she uses her innovative problem solving and conflict management skills to ensure her clients feel comfortable and supported as she supports them in navigating and resolving their family law matters. Brittany is also known for her minority rights advocacy. She received nat national attention for her role as lead counsel in a landmark transgender rights case, which led to her client receiving the first gender neutral birth certificate in Canada. This, ca this case acted as a catalyst for a countrywide policy and legislative reform aimed at promoting equality, diversity and inclusion. Next, we have Nafisa, and Nafisa is our Senior Managing Associate Lawyer at the firm. She is a collaboratively trained lawyer and has been practicing exclusively in all areas of family law for over 10 years with the best interests of children as a primary focus and providing legal advice and strategies for clients. She uses her skills as a collaborative lawyer to find creative ways of achieving positive results for her clients. Now that you know a little bit about our team and what we'll be discussing today, I'm gonna to pass things over to Nafisa. All right, so um, as usual, we're going to start our uh, webinar with a poll question. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit about uh, yourself. So if you could just fill out um, a little bit about yourself, whether you're a law professional, practicing law, are you practicing in another area, are you a government employee or a student, or if you're other. Um, for other, uh, feel free to share anonymously via the Q&A box. Um, where you're from, what you're doing. We'll give it a few minutes or seconds. All right, so um, 
a lot of students here. This is great to see um, law professionals, 24%. Um, we have uh, law professionals that are practicing in another area, 19%. Um, no government employees and um, a lot, about 11% that are other. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so the first topic, um, I'm just going to close the poll. Okay, so the first topic we're going to talk about is just defining diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, these are um, loaded words. Like, what do we mean when we talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, so the term diversity, we're really referring to the makeup um, of uh, a workforce, for example, and, and that's based on ranges of traits um, that that individual possesses. Um, and there's two types of traits. So there's there's two types of diversity. There's the inherent diversity, such as race, et ethnicity, sex, gender, sexual orientation, disability, but there's also acquired diversity. Um, and that's you know diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of family uh, status, culture, language. Um, and that's what sort of encompasses that term. Um, in terms of equity, um, this is sort of the outcome of fair treatment. Uh, fairness may look different based on an individual's power and privilege in society. Um, and when we look at e equity, it's really different from the term equality because equality really focuses on equal opportunities and treatment. Whereas the word um, equity, it, it goes a little bit further than equality. Um, and it actually accommodates needs um, to achieve a fair outcome. Um, and then when we talk about the term inclusion, um, what we're saying is sort of a state where everyone is welcomed, valued for their differences, actually empowered uh, to be their authentic selves um, and participate freely, contribute and really thrive um, with who they are. Um, the term EDI um, is really a continuum. So it's, it's sort of an ongoing journey um, of unlearning those deep-rooted uh, deep rooted beliefs and relearning sort of tools to um, overcome those uh, rooted attitudes that, that we all have. Um, and the EDI strategy um, is really a mechanism to challenge um, and change systemic issues um, that, uh, that are really deeply rooted. So to sum it up, uh, there's lots to unpack there, but uh, those are sort of defining those terms so that we're all kind of looking at it from that lens. So um, I'm going to talk about the importance of equity and, and thanks for your, uh, you know, in-depth analysis of what equity means, uh, Nafisa. And, you know, it's, it's really the thing I like to, um, to focus on when we talk about equity and the importance of equity is that equity is really meeting a person where they are and the gap um, to ensure that the outcome is equality, right? So that's a difference between equality and equity. A lot of people think they want equality, but it's really what, they, what we need is equity. And, you know, equity is important. Um, and, and we're talking about the workplace because uh, enabling equity in the workplace allows for job satisfaction and employee engagement. It really prevents dissatisfaction and ultimately it, uh, you know, increases employee action. Um, when you're working towards equity, for instance, instance, asking, you know, different individuals from different groups to spearhead meetings, um, or take on different projects or, or be, you know, to lead uh, different discussions, the satisfaction could be curbed, which ultimately brings, uh, brings down, you know, uh, employee attrition. Um, an individual or employee who, who feels respected, heard, and seen as they are is a, is a happier individual. And so with equity, an, uh, a firm or an organization, um, you know, that recognizes each individual, uh, you know, em employee has as having, um, you know, varying access to resources and privileges and those with less um, access and privilege may need more support in order to take advantage or fair advantage of the opportunities given within the, within the company. Um, so 
Next slide. That brings us into you know importance of diversity and inclusion. Um, so having a, a working environment filled with employees of different backgrounds, skills, and experiences, and knowledge means that there will be an increase in innovation and creative ideas. Right. Uh, everybody's coming in from a different not only different skill sets, but different experiences based on their own personal, you know, whatever, you know, their, their, their race, gender, gender identity, um, any sort of uh, disadvantages that they've experienced through their lives. And that means, you know, there'll be an increase in innovation and uh, it really impacts the organization. Um, it helps the organization expand and advance in the long run. Um, employees will feel more comfortable to share their ideas um, with, their, their unique ideas with others, um, with unique ideas being shared amongst uh, a diverse environment. Diversity also provides a range of skills. And I, like I said, everybody has different skills that they can provide and, and help to enhance an organization. And by having an, an inclusive and diverse environment, this means, this allows for a wider perspective to be considered and incorporated when, uh, you know, when you're brainstorming, problem solving and developing new ideas in the organization. Um, diversity and inclusion also, you know, can lead to increased productivity. You know, teamwork and cooperative uh, work can increase productivity in an organization because a diverse team can provide their ranges of experience and skills and allows other coworkers to learn and work well with each other. And so team members who come from diverse background experiences and again, who feel respected, heard, and seen as they are, are more likely uh, able to work together, which also increases overall productivity. Do you have any next? Yeah. So the next slide is um, the challenges faced by individuals based on gender, gender identity, and race. So first of all, I wanted to emphasize and note that we're focusing on gender, gender identity, and race. And uh, you know, we want to acknowledge and emphasize that there are challenges faced by individuals based on personal characteristics or experiences other than gender, gender identity, and race. Uh, but for the purposes of our discussion today, we are just focusing on, on those three uh, characteristics. So society, uh, in terms of gender, society has made, you know, significant strides over the past, you know, several decades towards gender, equal gender equality, but there's still more work to be done. Um, there continues to be a lack of women in positions of power and leadership. There remains a perception that women are less qualified and less competent than men, regardless of a woman's experience, education, or abilities. Internationally, um, there remains a dis disparity between men and women when it comes to education, because there remains societal beliefs that uh, women are less worthy of the same educational opportunities afforded to men. There are even more challenges faced by individuals who do not identify with the, you know, quote unquote, traditional gender identities. Individuals in the LGBTQ community continue to, continue to face discrimination. Um, they're often uh, marginalized and subject to you know, violence and discrimination. And that's, you know, true not only, you know, especially true in, in, in internationally. Um, individuals of racialized uh, communities face challenges such as discrimination based on stereotypes. Uh, immigrant minorities in particular face challenges when finding employment as a result of, you know, language barriers or this perception that they are somehow less competent to, a, to do a job because they don't have quote unquote Canadian experience. That's something that my parents often told me when they first immigrated to Canada, they were turned away from jobs because they lacked Canadian experience. Um, they usually accept uh, lower paying jobs that are sometimes, that there are sometimes, uh, they are sometimes overqualified to do. Um, as, a, as a woman of visible minority, I, I have experiences in the workplace and I'm going to share, you know, a personal experience I had, you know, and again, I'm coming from someone who is a, a, a woman who, who's a visible minority and that's where my experience is coming from, that's where uh, I'm going to be sharing my experience uh, as that, you know, woman of, of, of a, a visible minority. So when I had passed the bar, I had set, uh, sought the help of an uh, employment agency to help me find a position. And my then husband had an Anglo-Saxon surname and I had used his last name on my resume. Uh, the employment agency called me one day to let me know that the, the head of the HR at a law firm in Boston had wanted to meet with me. 
And the agency told me that the HR lady was very impressed with my resume and I was a shoe in this position. Like I, I essentially had the job, but I, she just wanted to meet me. So I ended up for the interview when the HR lady saw me, her, her face fell. And I knew right then and there that I wouldn't get the job. Um, she asked me about my last name. Like, why is your last name this last name? I explained that it was my husband's last name. And then she just went through the motions of an interview. Um, just like, it, it was just, I, I knew, it was needless to say I didn't get the job, but that was one of the most clear experiences I've ever had of discrimination in the workplace. And, and the reason why I'm giving this example is to say that, you know, to show that this is not something we're talking about happened 50 years ago. You know, this was, this happened, you know, 20 years ago at this point still, it's still something and, and you know, it's something that I still experience from time to time today. So um, that's, that's my experience in that. Um, so next slide is um, equity, diversity, inclusion in the workplace. To, to summarize what I said earlier, equity, diversity, inclusion in the workplace includes seeking out um, diverse candidates and or engaging in diverse training, which results in a workplace that is productive and operates more efficiently. Without diversity, organizations will most likely lack uh, new experiences and not be as competitive as other uh, companies that do embrace diversity. And so with a culture of equity and inclusion, um, employees who feel underrepresented are likely to quit, uh, taking their talents with them, which is a, a, a huge loss for any company or workplace. You have any thoughts, guys, on that? Thanks, Margie. You know, your story just rang so true to me, Margie. Um, you know, being a professional um, in, in law is and a, a visible minority. It is challenging at times. And, and I think we've all faced those experiences um, uh, where we felt discriminated against for the way that we, we look, you know. Um, and it's, it's so unfortunate that it still happens. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing. I know that, that uh, it, it's hard to share these experiences. Nobody really talks about them, but, um, you know, bringing it out and talking about it, I think is, is one of the first steps to change. Brittany, do you have any comments? I do actually, I think, um, I find now because diversity is is really on everybody's radar, sometimes people will do, uh, you know, add visible minorities to their team so that they can check a box essentially to say that they now they have diversity representation, but that's not enough. You need equity and inclusion in order to retain that talent as Mar Margie pointed out. The, um, the individuals that are joining your team need to feel like they belong, that they're welcomed and have the opportunities to, uh, to grow and, and thrive. Yeah, I totally agree with that comment. Thanks, uh, Brittany. Um, I think the next slide is actually another poll question. Um, so where do you see the greatest gaps within your own organization uh, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives? So the, the options are, you know, no commitment to it, no funding, no time. There's a lack of knowledge and understanding of the actual issues, a lack of staff, all of the above or none of the above. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, I think the results are out. So 44% uh, um, have said it's a lack of knowledge and understanding of the issues. 20% um, um, say that there's no commitment to it. 19% all of the above. Um, and then the 19% uh, uh, none of the above. 9% um, no funding, no time. Interesting that lack of knowledge and understanding of the issues is sort of that, um, the, the primary response. Um, and so, you know, webinars like this is are hopefully gonna help fill that gap a little bit, uh, but I do agree um, that that's probably one of the main reasons. Um, 
that this issue is, is it's, you know, it's not tackled um, adequately at firms. All right, um, so the next slide is what you can do to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace, um, as well as in your personal life. Um, so uh, Marjorie, do you wanna start us off with this question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the first step uh, for, for anyone, either in your personal life or in the workplace, is to recognize and be aware of any unconscious bias that you might have. Um, and the first step in making real change is really understanding that, that you, everybody has unconscious bias and, and really building that awareness. Um, unconscious bias can include associations or feelings of bias that may be hidden underneath the surface. Unconscious bias, uh, unconscious biases don't necessarily align or match up with the conscious beliefs or your de declared beliefs, um, which means unconscious biases are even more important to pay attention to because you're not really aware of them. So one way to build awareness and address uh, unbiased conscious is to, uh, unconscious bias is to review, um, question and really analyze your own personal biases and assumptions and to be really be brutally honest with yourself about those biases. And, you know, we can manage the bias and foster more inclusive environments by remaining curious and humble about cultural differences. You know, continue to be curious and ask questions about, you know, different uh, differences between, you know, cultures and uh, individuals and their experiences. No one is an expert, but everyone is on a continuous learning journey when it comes to respecting and embracing other people's experiences and realities. And becoming, you know, culturally competent is really a lifelong practice. And organizations can help their employees manage their own biases through training that provides guidance on actions from being forward. And training really helps us understand that we don't have uh, we don't have unconscious biases because we're bad, we're bad people, but we have them because we are people. Right. Um, and Brittany, how about you? What about this question? What would you, uh, what do you, what do you think you can do to promote equity, diversity, inclusion in the workplace? Sure. I, I'll um, speak to some of the initiatives that we've rolled out at our firm. Um, our, our diversity committee is still in its infancy, but we've, we've already established a few initiatives. Uh, one would be show respect for preferred pronouns. You can ask others uh, to disclose their pronouns when you're first interacting with them to help eliminate any confusion or misunderstandings. And you may also choose to share your pronouns on, on the company website, invite your team to share their pronouns uh, on their LinkedIn, email signatures, and this helps to show respect and allyship for the community and, and gender uh, diverse individuals. Uh, again, we serve a diverse community. And when people come to us uh, looking for advice, looking for help, we don't always have the information or ability to meet all of their, their needs. So something that we've uh, recently rolled out is um, asking our, our intake team members to compile a list of referrals and resources. So we can, we can refer clients to crisis helplines, trauma, social workers, uh, shelters, welcome centers for immigrate, for uh, new immigrants, just to make sure that uh, we are respecting everybody and, and trying to give them the best service uh, we can. Um, another in-house initiative that we have is um, moving away from just celebrating uh, holidays that are, that are more focused upon in, in Western societies. We want to expand uh, our list of celebrations. Uh, we love an excuse to celebrate at Russell Alexander. Uh, expand it to celebrate other observances and special occasions and accommodate everyone and, and really cultivate that, that sense of belonging. Thanks, Brittany. Those are some great ideas. Um, I'm going to, mine is going to be very quickly because we have so much to talk about. It's already 1224. I don't know where the time is going, uh, but I, I, mine's kind of cheesy. It's really be the change you want to see. So, I mean, start with yourself, start with your belief system, start with uh, making sure that you're respectful. Um, I love that word, cur curious, that you use, Margie. Just, you know, be curious uh, and be open-minded um, because, you know, you grow when you're, you yourself can recognize that you have these biases and work to change them um, rather than denying that you have them. We all have them. It's like you said, Margie, it's not nothing bad 
um, but recognizing that we have these biases so that you can actually tackle the problem face on um, and, and make those changes. So um, sort of that's, uh, those are my thoughts on this question. Um, so in terms of the next slide, um, the Law Society mandate. Um, so the, the, Law Society, the Law Society is tackling um, the barriers that are, uh, that, that face, that racialized licensees are facing. And they're doing this by implementing some strategies. Um, so uh, they really have three main strategies. So educating for change, measuring progress, and accelerating, accelerating diversity. So um, with educating for change, um, as part of this initiative, what the Law Society is doing is that they're asking all licensee, all licensees, um, uh, they're requiring them to complete um, EDI hours. So it's three hours, three EDI hours by 2020, um, and then um, one EDI hour of CPD per year starting in 2021. So they're really forcing um, licensees to um, get that knowledge and information because that's again, a, a great starting point uh, for these issues. Uh, measuring progress. So they're also gathering data through um, workplace assessments. Um, they're, they're seeking voluntary um, responses. Um, these are really, you know, a sensitive topics. So, um, so, you know, forcing someone to disclose information, personal information about um, themselves um, is not necessarily the most um, uh, the best way to to obtain information. So it, a lot of these questions that the Law Society um, or a lot of the surveys that they're putting out there, they are voluntary. Um, and in terms of their initiative to accelerate diversity, um, their requirement, uh, they're requiring um, an acknowledgement um, of human rights laws in, act in the actual um, annual report um, that uh, we file every year um, as lawyers. So uh, legal workplaces that have at least 10 licensees, um, they are required to also uh, develop, implement, and maintain a human rights diversity policy for their legal workforce. Um, and this is addressing, um, at the very least, the issue of recruitment, retention, and advancement. So these are policies that have to be implemented by all workplaces that have at least 10 licensees, according to the Law Society. Um, the next slide is um, the Law Society of Ontario, the EDI or the DEI. So I, I say EDI because that's the Law Society words, but we've reversed it to DEI. It's, it's exactly the same, um, the same thing. Um, so what the Law, the Law Society has implemented is a workplace um, self-assessment uh, questionnaire. Um, it must be completed as part of a representative's annual report every two years for a workplace that has at least 10 licensees. Um, and some of the, the, the questions that are part of this questionnaire, um, it's really to tackle whether that workplace is demonstrating a commitment to addressing the issues of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so it asks about, you know, does the company, does the firm have a working plan for DEI? Does, do they have formal policies? Um, are you, are, is the firm collecting data to measure and track progress on DEI? Um, is the firm establishing internal initiatives designed to support DEI? So these are really great questions to, uh, to see uh, how people are tackling the issue and also their commitment to it. So this is a great questionnaire um, and will provide some very good data um, upon which um, policies can further be um, implemented by the Law Society. Next slide. All right, another poll. Um, so does your workplace have a diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion committee? Yes or no, or in progress? Let's give it just a few seconds. We're at 1230 in terms of time. So I think we're doing okay for time. So 45% said yes, 45% said no, and 13% said in progress. Um, I'm happy to hear that 45% already has a, a DEI committee. Um, that's great to hear. And hopefully the 45% the that doesn't have a DEI a committee can uh, start working on that. 
Um, all right, what's our next topic? So I think this is a seamless transition. Uh, so Brittany's gonna talk to us about starting a committee. Thank you, yes. Um, I'm really happy to see that over half of you either have a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI committee in your workplace, or, or um, on the way to to creating one. Uh, we we established our committee in March of this year. As I mentioned, it's still in its infancy, but I'm I'm happy to share some of the insights we've gained, uh, processes, and strategies that have have worked for us. So, in terms of starting your committee, I suggest uh, you kick it off by selecting a leader. Select an executive DEI champion to spearhead the initiative. Ideally, uh, you want to pick somebody who's experienced, knowledgeable, and passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Um, next is to communicate the project to your larger team. Share the intent of the project and why it's a priority for the organization. We uh, use a company newsletter that we, uh, we issue monthly to, to share information about this initiative. Um, and then we asked participants to express any desire, expressions of interest uh, to the diversity leader um, uh, so that we could figure out who's interested and then compile our, our committee. You wanna make sure that you are, you're building a solid foundation of knowledge. So committee members, again, ideally, should have an understanding of concepts and dialogues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This ensures a common language and comprehension and supports the change management needed for this work. That said, if you do not have people within your organization with DEI knowledge or training, that's okay. Form your committee anyways and learn as you go. There's lots of great resources out there. This is a continuum. It's a learning curve for everyone, no matter where you are, no matter where you start. And we're gonna keep sharing information and updating you on our tips and recommendations. Uh, the, another thing to think about is the committee composition. Who's gonna be on this committee? You've got your leader. You also will wanna involve key stakeholders uh, and build a diverse committee. You wanna make sure that the organization is represented holistically and all groups have a spokesperson to bring issues that impact them to light. Recruit individuals from various departments, so maybe finance, marketing, admin, uh, and individuals with various backgrounds and identities. Also find people who are passionate about it, influential and lead by example. In terms of assigning roles and responsibilities, you need a core team with subject matter experts. Um, you might want to establish small groups and subcommittees for teamwork and networking across functions, but then have program managers to make sure that the initiatives have an owner and someone who's stewarding the work. It's important that at least one representative on the committee has a seat and voice at the highest tables to champion the work. Um, so maybe somebody in management um, communicate the high level subject matter, provide the guidance on achieving the priorities um, and, and ensure strategic alignment. You also wanna make sure there's a channel for upward feedback from, from employees to, to the committee and then through management so that everybody's voice is being heard and considered. Next, I'm gonna talk about allies and leaders and everybody has a role to play. So as, as Margie pointed out earlier, We've all inherited biases or prejudices in one way or another, whether they are conscious or unconscious. So that means there's no room on the sidelines while others do the work. Committee members should be expect, committee members should not be expected to do all the heavy lifting. Invite everyone to have a voice and affirm that everyone's opinion is valued. Make sure everyone has a role to play as allies, leaders, and champions when it comes to creating an organizational culture that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. DEI will not work with a subset of individuals. All team members should be expected to collaborate and participate in DEI initiatives, call out and report inappropriate behaviors, and educate themselves about systems of oppression, consider their own power and privilege, and treat others with respect. Create a culture of accountability and ask everyone to do their part. One way to do this, um, and, and I'll speak a little bit to that, that question that came up about how do we track progress. You can add DEI criteria to employee performance reviews. Um, so making sure that if, if, if people want to receive a positive review that they're also demonstrating those, those behaviors and working toward that common goal. Keep management accountable too. 
one way to test whether or not management is fulfilling its commitment to, to the, the goal is to issue anonymous employee feedback surveys. This data can then be used to recognize, recognize gaps and reconfigure your approach. So just remember, DEI work is a process of, of learning and unlearning deeply rooted attitudes that guide the way people inter interact and affect how organizations operate. It's a journey. There's no quick fix or race to the finish line, but if everybody works together, we have a much better chance of succeeding. So we'll move to the next slide, funding the committee. DEI work takes dedicated time, energy, and frankly, a budget. It's disappointing to see so many organizations expecting this work to be done on the cheap. It takes time to analyze, listen, and understand how discrimination shows up within a given organization. Then comes the work of implementing an organizational shift. DEI work is a marathon, not a sprint, and it requires a realistic budget over multiple years. So create a scale and purposeful strategy. Then determine what resources are required. Resource, resource work appropriately. Consider recruiting consultants with specialized expertise. Uh, I noticed on our survey that a lot of people feel the, the major gap is that they don't have the, uh, the requisite knowledge, uh, understanding of the issues. So perhaps outsource, bring new thinking into the work. This field is ever evolving. It can be difficult for an internal team to keep up with the latest and greatest thinking solutions and information. You can invest in systems, tools, and resources that enable behavior change. There's lots of tech on the market right now uh, for DEI in the workplace. Invest in change, train and educate your team, upskill your team. Consider covering DEI-related CLE fees. This one is free, but there are others out there. And, and uh, one way a firm can dedicate its commitment to this issue, uh, ensure that everybody is up to speed, is by being prepared to, to pay, pay for those fees. Consider how the long-run benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion will add to your organization when deciding what resources to allocate. But don't rely... So, so if, if, you, if you can't afford to bring out the, the outside talent in to revamp your organization, the work can be done in-house, but don't rely solely on volunteers. This is not sustainable. Often the marginalized are the ones asked to take on side projects and volunteer work related to DEI. This is unfair. It perpetuates the problem of undervaluing DEI work and burdens experienced by minorities. Don't take advantage of passionate people within your organization by expecting them to do the work for free. Compensate employees for contributions. Invest in a centralized team to do the work alongside volunteers who want to get involved. Recognize and reward employees for demonstrating leadership and commitment to DEI goals. So I want to move on to the next slide. The hidden cost of DEI work. This is, this is visionary and revolutionary work. It involves a lot of hope and faith that people and institutions and organizations can and are willing to change ingrained ways of thinking and doing things. Endeavoring to undo a legacy of systemic inequality can come at great cost. Some of those costs are known and necessary. Known costs include the de dedication of organizational resources and the investment of one's own transformation in this work. Awakening, progress, and change may push participants outside of their comfort zones as they challenge norms we have collectively allowed, tolerated, perpetuated, suffered, and or benefited from. Discomfort and vulnerability will be part of the process. Practitioners will be required to, to sit with those feelings, ask themselves what to do about them, and make changes. The known costs are worthy investments in personal growth and organizational developments, but then come the hidden costs. The hidden costs exact a heavy toll on the people who facilitate, train, educate, champion, and embody DEI work. The hidden costs are often disproportionately borne by minorities. Marginalized individuals involved in social justice work experience a physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual cost, while also personally navigating the impacts of racism sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, colonialism, ageism, ableism, et cetera, in their own lives, communities, workplaces, and societies. Calling out inappropriate behaviors and marginalizing dynamics in the workplace is not easy. This is additional labor to hold the emotions of others. 
and it poses a great personal and professional risk to the people who are doing the work. Individuals may face repercussions for pointing out harmful behavior. DEI leaders may feel personally responsible for the people in the room. They may internalize the rage, anxiety, doubt, frustration, and pain in workplace dialogues. Some may feel nervous they will let others down or fail their people or ancestors. This work may lead to real fatigue and burnout, cynicism and disillusionment with their workplaces, with, with their peers, with their colleagues and, and, and society at large. So that's why we're gonna move on to the next slide and talk about supporting your DEI committee and others. How do we mitigate the costs and risks of harm? Number one, be ready for this work. It's not enough to want to do DEI work. You have to commit to this work for the long haul. Don't consider it a passion project. Don't do it to tick a box. Set your mission and your values. Align your DEI strategy with your values. Be ready to acknowledge that something is not working and set expectations for improvement. Don't tolerate harm or behaviors that don't align with your mission and values. Know where you sit in all of this. Look in the mirror and acknowledge the ways you are complicit and the ways you challenge the status quo. Then, appropriately resource the work. An organization's budget says a lot about its values. Do not shortchange DEI work. If you're tempted to do so, Ask yourself why. Then take the opportunity to unpack biases around what is valued, who is valued, and examine any disconnects that arise. Be prepared to pay for downtime and processing time so the people performing this work do not suffer personal or vicarious trauma. Offer compensatory time and mental health days to your team. Number three is reward self-care. Self-care must be an organizational priority, accessible to all. Reward and model practicing self-care and provide ample resources and supports to your team. I, I've been in workplaces before where uh, we profess a commitment to, to mental health and well-being, but the, uh, the managers are working all hours of the night. And because you're seeing that, you, you know, you know it's, it's, um, it's more of a performative or a uh, you, you know the underlying expectation is to, to burn the midnight oil alongside them. So it's important not just to, to express the commitments, but also, also model it um, and, and really make that a priority. Number four, listen. Create restorative, healing, and safe spaces for feedback and dialogue. Listen to one another. You can use surveys. You can use employee resource groups. Um, just ways to, to tune in and actively listen. Number five, learn and respond. We all make mistakes. It's important that we learn from them and continue to grow and improve. Number six, celebrate the wins. Success doesn't happen overnight. Breaking a large task into smaller chunks can help ease the pressure and, sub and the sense of overwhelm. Pause to celebrate the wins along the way. This will remind you and your team of the goals you set and why you set them. It will help keep the focus, motivation, and momentum. It will help to unify your team around a common goal and positive outcome. Plus, DEI is, is really worth celebrating. And I think Nafis is now gonna talk about why it matters so much in the workplace. Yeah, I'm going to um, pause here for the, the, the previous slide and just talk a little bit about, you know, that token. Um, some people just want to, to show a commitment to DI because, like you said, they're just ticking off a box um, um, on a to-do list. DI is so deep-rooted and, and really, it, it, you know, one of the questions that came in is how do you measure, um, you know, your strategies? And it's really retention. Um, so if, if you have a firm where, you know, there's a ma mass exit of lawyers or you're a rotating door where people are coming in and out, exit surveys in, in those situations will probably highlight that that is not an inclusive work environment, um, maybe a toxic work environment. It may be an environment where someone is not feeling valued, um, where, you know, they're being overworked, undervalued, for example. So those are all, you know, 
uh, it takes real commitment. Um, and, and also, Brittany, talking about that emotional cost, you know, to DEI work, um, this is this is really hard work, um, you know, and, and you're like, like you said, it's not fair to ask for um, for volunteers to be doing this work and creating these policies and procedures and, and really working hard to create an environment of inclusion for free. And it does fall on, you know, um, minorities, it falls on women, it falls on um, uh, people that are, you know, that, that will do the work because they're so passionate about the issues, not that there aren't uh, others that, that are not pa passionate, but really seeking that, uh, that compensation, getting, a, getting the funds uh, to form a, a very strong basis for, for uh, the strategies and pr procedures that come out of that work. So yes, it's it, just a few comments on the, some of the things that you've said, um, I think have, have really uh, rung true to me. How about yourself, Margie, in terms, I mean, there's so much to unpack with, with all the things you've said, Brittany. Yeah, I agree. I, I, and I think that a, if, if a firm has, and, and, you know, regardless of what this, this mandate from law society that you have to have 10 licensees, if a firm or a workplace has, ha, you know, shown the willingness and has established a, a DEI committee and has shown a, a, a commitment to and willingness to fund that, you know, and allow um, an openness amongst their employees, um, you know, and, and employees feel that they're able to express how they experiencing or, or be the, the subject of, or, you know, of unconscious biases and, you know, through, like Brittany mentioned, like what we've been doing at firm is, you know, um, anonymous uh, um, surveys. I think that sort of level of commitment is, you know, it, it's really important um, in the sense that when you're doing that as a firm, that's a, that's a message to your employees that, that you are willing to listen to them, right? Um, and I, what I, what I, in terms of measuring it, um, you know, whether or not your, your policies are, are, are working, it's really getting to, again, you know, continuing these, these surveys, I think in our firm, the DEI committee is going to continue doing is from time to time, checking in with the employees, how are these policies working? Right? Um, it's really like we think about, you know, what, what our policies will be and how we want to implement them, but are they really having the effect we want? For the for the 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 you know for our employees, and so these sorts of things are you know having that sort of taking those steps and having those um, um, things in place at a firm or a workplace I think shows to your employees that what they say and how their experience matters to you as management. So. Right. Um, yeah, so thanks for all your comments, uh, Brittany, and on, on the, uh, you know, committee and uh, for really spearheading the DEI committee at, at the firm. And, um, you know, and I'm hoping that, you know, as we go on through the years, we'll, we'll refine our process. But yeah, it's uh, a lot of um, really excellent comments. Yeah, and, and I also think in terms of, you know, it, it's about it's about discussion. It's about opening up the lines of dis, uh, of lines of communication. So I know that you know at our firm we've implemented one on ones with um, each um, each member of our team has an opportunity to have a one on one once a week with a manage uh, a manager, um, and and that form you know that that is is really relationship building. Uh, because if you trust the person that's managing you, you will be um, more willing to open up to uh, issues that you're dealing with, with peers, uh, with, co uh, with councils on the other side, for example, even with judges, with other, you know, members of, uh, of the, uh, the associate, like the Durham region, for example, association. And those discussions, it, what's, it, it's what's necessary just to first really feel comfortable enough to disclose or to talk about these issues. Um, even if it's just with with management and then um, formulating solutions to those to those problems, you know, what are you going to do about it? Because it's not enough to just acknowledge that it exists. It's really what are you going to what's the next step after that? Um, and what are you going to do about it? So I'm really happy to see that, you know, 
um, like Brittany said, we are in our early stages um, of the, the DEI committee. Um, and we're always learning. Um, so there, you know, you're never, you, you, this, you, although you're never really a subject expert mat on this matter, right? Because it's evolving, it's changing, and it's, it's really about um, obtaining the knowledge uh, and the information um, to tackle the issues that, um, that people are dealing with. And, and again, discussion is so important because as part of a team, uh, we have quite a few lawyers that work with us. And, and you know, when, when um, I know that there was an issue that I was dealing with, um, which is really ageism, you know, I feel like people judge, um, w w I was being judged because I, uh, I wasn't um, a, a senior lawyer, for example, and I was being treated unfairly. And just um, speaking to a senior lawyer at the firm, recognizing that this is my experience, broadened his perspective on it, because he said, Oh, I've never experienced that. So, you know, just telling him, this is my story. This is how, this is how I feel. This is what I went through. And having that conversation broadened um, his mind and sort of um, got that on his radar because it wasn't his experience. So again, discussion is so important uh, about these issues. Um, so the next uh, slide is uh, really about, you know, the benefits of uh, DEI um, in the work place. Um, and so, you know, there's there's so many benefits to having, um, uh, you know, the EDI committee, to having dedicated members of the firm that are working on, um, on these issues. Um, but as Brittany said, it's every single person. So just because you have a few that have championed uh, the cause, it doesn't mean that everyone um, sort of uh, wipes their hands of the responsibility and, and lets uh, just a, a handful of people deal with the issue. It's, it's, it's in order to form a firm that's going to thrive, um, each member of that firm has to um, has to show initiative and, and has to, to do their part um, in, in, form, in forming a team that's uh, inclusive um, and diverse and, and, and that, um, that's uh, equitable as well. Um, so some of the benefits that I've, I've um, highlighted um, is that uh, DEI really heightens opportunities for innovation and growth. Um, one of the reasons I love working at this firm is because we're we're, we're such a diverse group. Um, and when we're strategizing, when we have issues or questions of, uh, you know, on certain cases, uh, we have so many different opinions. Everyone's coming with their own um, experiences and we're able to come to a really uh, good solution because we have so many voices at the table. Um, and so that allows us to come up with really great solutions to problems that we may be having on files. Um, it also increases um, understanding and teamwork. Um, so again, back to that example, you know, sharing your experience um, with others who may not ex have the same experiences broadens their um, broadens their horizons as well as yours by having those really important discussions. Um, it also reduces conflict. Um, so ensuring that you have a mechanism in place to address these issues, a formal way to um, bring them forward, but also to tackle how you're going to solve problems that arise as a result of some of the issues that come, um, come to the forefront. Um, it encourages engagement. So if you feel like your voice is valued, if you know you have a seat at the table, um, then you're more likely to get engaged um, and to have discussions and to feel like you belong somewhere. Um, so having that sense of belonging, you're able, you know, it, it improves um, performance, it improves pr productivity. Um, you're, you're the best version of yourself when you're, you feel, you know, that you belong, you feel like you're valued, you feel like you're in a place where you can voice your opinion without um, uh, without having reservations. Um, it, imp it also in improves employee morale. Um, it reduces employee turnover. So one of those um, earlier discussions we talked about, you know, sort of that revolving door, door firm, um, where, and I've been at them, and I, I don't know, Margie and Brittany, if you've been at firms where you know in your head you're not there forever because they just don't have um, the, the, the policies in place for you to feel like this is somewhere you want to be for a long period of time. 
Um, so you're in and out, um, you're getting your experience and, and you know, you're not going to provide more than, um, than just your hours for that firm. Um, it attracts talent. Um, knowing that you have an inclusive work environment, um, you're going to get the best talent. Uh, people are going to want to come work with you, for you. Um, so your team is going to improve uh, because you have um, the policies in place to ensure that everyone um, uh, feels like they belong. Um, it increases retention, um, it improves reputation. So there's so many uh, hidden benefits of it, but obviously, you know, um, it's gotta be, it's gotta be deep rooted. It's, it, it can't just be something that you're doing um, to show others that, oh, guess what? We do have a DEI um, uh, committee and we are, you know, we have these policies and procedures. It's gotta be lived. It's gotta be, um, it's gotta be within the culture and that takes a deep commitment um, to the issue. Um, Brittany, any, uh, any thoughts on the benefits? I agree with, with everything that you said about the benefits. They're, they're many fold, um, and it, it's, it's certainly worth investing in. I, I saw a question that, that came in, um, that, that I can speak to. The question asked, how do you get around, um, victimization by involvement in diversity, equity, inclusion actions in the workplace. Um, and I actually had, I had an experience of that where uh, I, I was part of a group that uh, was discussing these issues and I spoke up and uh, said something that was, that was quite ignorant, but uh, it was just coming from a place of lack of knowledge, not a, a, a place of, um, uh, of malice or, or bad intention. Um, so I think it's important to create safe spaces for, for dialogue, for, for conversations, allow, allow for mistakes, uh, for failure, allow for, for constructive criticism. And remember, the goal is, is to teach and to learn, not to punish, unless, of course, something rises to the, to the level of legal discrimination or harassment. But, uh, you know, call everyone to the table so that way you're not being singled out get curious, ask questions. Sometimes people don't ask questions because they don't want to want to know the answers or they don't get involved because they're afraid um, of the reaction that they'll receive or a loss of control or change is, is uncomfortable. It involves a lot of uncertainty, fear of the unknown uh, and it can involve fear of being attacked or excluded. So just have conversations. They can be hard, they can be messy, allow it and just focus on the goal, <clears throat> growth and, and, and learning. Thanks, Brittany. There was also a comment about, you know, uh, someone working at a firm where um, there was a, a great divide between the lawyers and the assistants. Um, and, and, and honestly, teamwork is so important. So I don't understand why there's such a divide between lawyers and legal assistants or other members of the firm, because we're all so important. Um, and we all provide different skill sets and different things that really require we require every member of that uh, team to provide the product, right? So I, I do agree with that comment. I've seen it in other workplaces where, um, you know, there's a real divide where the lawyers are seen as higher up or, um, you know, better than everyone else. And, and honestly, um, I can't say how much our firm relies on all of our law clerks and all of our marketing people and, um just such great skills. Um, it's 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 quite embarrassing how much we rely on uh, other members of our team to ensure that uh, that we service our clients. So that that comment also rang true uh, in terms of my previous experiences. Um, another comment that we got was regarding you know how many uh, people have attended this program, and that would give a good indication of uh, you know the importance of this topic. Uh, so today we have uh, about 86 participants. So that's a pretty good number. I was very happy to see um, that there were uh, that many participants. Um, and I think there were more registered but couldn't make it. But 86 is a very good number. Um, uh, because I, I think, you know, uh, again, this is a, a very important topic. Um, and it just, you know, it, it, it's, you have to have that commitment, you have to have that knowledge and, and, and you know, uh, where better to start than uh, a webinar on the topic. So I thought it was a great turnout. 
Margie, any final comments? Well, I, first of all, I, I just wanted to go back to the Law Society mandate. I, what I want to say is I, I actually want to commend our Law Society for, for really recognizing the need for this accelerated cultural change in the legal profession, and which is what, what prompted you know, this, this mandate and, and requirement for DEI. I don't want people to think that it's a requirement because the Law Society mandates it. I think I hope this the webinar they understand the benefit not just to themselves but to their to their company or firm, right? It goes beyond um, your personal growth as a human being, but it also goes to uh, your growth within a within a firm or company and your your firm and company's growth. All right, thanks, Margie. All right. Thank you so much, Nafisa, Margie, and Brittany. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights and, and your experience on this very important topic. And we just want to thank everyone again for joining us today and supporting these conversations. And we hope that this has helped in some way to continue these conversations beyond here as well. Um, thank you to everyone who participated and sent in questions. If you do have any questions or any comments for our team, please feel free to reach out to me at shannon at russellalexander.com. We also have a survey that will pop up in your browser following the webinar. So please, if you have the time, we welcome and, welcome and appreciate any feedback you have from today's session so we can take it into consideration as we continue to grow. And uh, just a note that we do host our virtual event series bi-weekly on Wednesdays at 12 p.m. on a variety of family law topics. However, our next presentation will be hosting a two-day special event, um, and that will be on Wednesday, September 21st and Thursday, se September 22nd. And there'll be a variety of family law topics, and we'll make sure to include those details in a follow-up email tomorrow. So just want to thank everyone again, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.